Thank you, Seth. Well, it's a joy to be gathered together this morning in uh, our assembly, and it's a joy because the triune God, as the refrain in our first hymn uh, exalted in, has assembled us for a purpose this morning, and that purpose is to worship Him. We worship God through many different means, through prayer and song, and now we come to worship our Lord through the reading of Scripture. And you'll see in the bulletin that our Scripture reading is in the first chapter of 1 Corinthians. Uh, Before I go there, I will read two verses from Jeremiah chapter 9. And I think after I read both of these texts, it will become clear to you why I'm doing this. Uh, Because the Apostle Paul, I'm convinced, had this text in Jeremiah in mind when he was writing the paragraph in 1 Corinthians. So I will read Jeremiah 9, 23 and 24, and then turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Thus says the Lord, Let not the wise man boast in his wisdom. Let not the mighty man boast in his might. Let not the rich man boast in his riches. But let him who boasts boast in this, that he understands and knows me, that I am the Lord who practices steadfast love, justice, and righteousness in the earth. For in these things I delight, declares the Lord. Now I'm turning to 1 Corinthians chapter 1, and I will read beginning in verse 26 through verse 31. The Apostle Paul writes, For consider your calling, brothers. Not many of you were wise according to worldly standards. Not many were powerful. Not many were of noble birth. But God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised in the world, even things that are not, to bring to to nothing things that are, so that no human being might boast in the presence of God. And because of Him, you are in Christ Jesus, who became to us wisdom from God, righteousness, and sanctification and redemption, so that as it is written, let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. Gideon triumphed over the Midianites by the foolishness of God. Foolishness by human standards, anyway. Gideon and his 300 men went into battle equipped with nothing more than clay pots, torches and trumpets against an army more numerous than they, more powerful than they. That's foolish. But God chooses the foolish things to shame the wise of this world. God chooses the weak things to shame the strong. He chooses the nothings of this world to render powerless those who seem to be somethings. The purpose of all this is that no human being might boast in the presence of God. In Gideon's case, the Lord wanted to make it clear that it was he who was delivering his people. And so when Gideon was with uh, the full ranks of his thousands and tens of thousands, the Lord said to him, The people with you are too many for me to give the Midianites into their hand, lest Israel boast over me and say, My own hand has saved me. Israel was supposed to boast in the Lord, but it was in their nature to claim, My own hand has saved me. And some things never change. Pride lurks deep in the heart of man. We want to say, my own hand has saved me. We take pride in things like economic prosperity, academic attainments, and social status. Pride and self-glorying are just as much a problem today as they were in Gideon's day. 
And that's the problem that Paul addressed in the beginning chapters of his first letter to the Corinthians. According to 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 10 and 11, the problem that Paul is addressing was that there were schisms, divisions in the church. At the root of these divisions was human pride. The Corinthians were boasting in the wisdom and eloquence of men. Some saying, I follow Paul, and others, I follow Apollos. As a solution to this problem, Paul first reminded the Corinthians in verses 18 to 25 that they were not saved by human wisdom, but by the word of the cross, which is foolishness in the world's eyes. Next, he reminded the believers in verses 26 to 29 that they had no reason to boast in their own nobility, wisdom, or strength. Not many of them possessed these things when the Lord called them. Ultimately, Paul's solution to their pride problem comes in verses 30 and 31, where we find his command to boast in the Lord. That's our subject this morning. And I want to consider this subject uh, in three ways. First of all, uh, the truth that you should boast in the Lord. Secondly, why you should boast in the Lord. And thirdly, how you should boast in the Lord. So we'll begin with verse 31, and uh, here's why. Notice that verse 31 begins with a so that. This shows us that the Lord's purpose or the Lord's intention for verse 30 is found in verse 31. The ultimate point in the text is our duty to boast in the Lord. But we get the foundation for that duty in verse 31. Uh, So we may consider the statement of God's work in verse 30 as the reason for our duty in verse 31. And... Accordingly, we will look first at the fact that you should boast in the Lord in verse 31 before considering the reason or reasons why found in verse 30. The fact is that you, you and I should be boasting in the Lord. That's what verse 31 says. Let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. That's the whole aim of Paul's argument at this point in the letter. Uh, But this is not just a Corinthians or a New Testament thing. Uh, though that would be enough in and of itself to bind our consciences. With one voice, the Old and New Testaments uh, trumpet over you with this demand that you should boast in the Lord. That's the significance of the phrase in verse 31, just as it is written. Just as the people of Judah in Jeremiah's day, so do we, like the Corinthians of Paul's day, need to resist boasting in our own wisdom, might, and riches. Instead, as Jeremiah wrote in Jeremiah 9, verse 24, let him who boasts boast in this, that he understands and knows me, that I am the Lord who practices steadfast love, justice, and righteousness in the earth, for in these things I delight, declares the Lord. To boast in something is, in this biblical sense, to trust in, or to glory in, or to boast about, to brag about. To boast in something is to put your confidence in it, or to take pride in something. And our problem is that just like the Corinthians, we trust in and brag about ourselves. Even as believers, we're not immune to this. We put our confidence and pride in ourselves and what we can achieve on our own. And if we did not take pride in things like economic prosperity and academic attainment, our own wisdom, uh, or in some sense, nobility, if we, if we didn't take pride in these things, we wouldn't need to be exhorted in this way. We need to be reminded to boast in the Lord and not in these other things. We do. We need to hear this. And I wonder for you, what are those things, those other things in which you might boast in your own life? I can't see into your heart this morning. What are those other things 
Take stock of your life at this point. What are you boasting in other than the Lord, if there's anything? Where is your confidence and pride directed this morning? We need to understand this inescapable duty to boast in the Lord. He is the one who should have our trust, confidence, and pride. He is the one in whom we should boast. Now we could close our Bible at this point, sing a hymn, and go home, and we would have said nothing untrue. It is true that it is our non-negotiable duty to boast in the Lord. It's true. But the Scriptures don't leave us with a bare statement of our duty to God. In His kindness, in His kindness, the Lord has attached to His command a wonderful, motivating, an enabling statement of His grace. Even as He commands to act for Him in verse 31, He has reminded us of what He has already done for us in verse 30. All the motivation that you need to obey the Lord's command in verse 31 is found in verse 30. That's what we consider next. Why you should boast in the Lord. First, boast in the Lord because of His initiating grace. It's because of God that you are in Christ Jesus. It's because of God and not because of you that you are in Christ Jesus. In other words, God chose and called you for union with Jesus Christ. To put it even more elaborately, uh, God unconditionally chose you for Himself. He effectually called you to Himself so that you would Believe and be united to Jesus Christ, His Son. This teaching comes through clearly in the whole first chapter of 1 Corinthians. God effectually called you. Paul greeted the Corinthians as those called to be saints in verse 2. And in verse 9, Paul revealed that God is the one who calls the saints to Himself. To be specific, God is faithful by whom you were called into the fellowship of His Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. The preaching of the Word of the cross, which is the message about Christ crucified, is the power and wisdom of God to those who are called. Verse 24. And notice at the top of our paragraph in verse 26, it begins with Paul's admonition to the Corinthians, consider your calling, brothers. The truth of God's effectual calling of the Corinthian believers was especially important to Paul. This was a very practical issue for him. It was one of the antidotes to the divisions in the church rooted in pride. The truth of this doctrine was one that he experienced repeatedly in his missionary work. If you remember in Acts chapter 16, when Paul's in Philippi with Silas, he comes to the riverside in Philippi and meets with Lydia and an, another group of uh, Jewish women worshiping there. And Luke describes Lydia's conversion like this. The Lord opened her heart to pay attention to what was said by Paul. That's Acts 16, verse 14. It was through Paul's preaching that the Holy Spirit called Lydia so that she believed and was baptized. And Thomas Watson, uh, in his uh, poetic, characteristically poetic uh, fashion, described this in this way. Ministers knock at the door of men's hearts. The Spirit comes with a key and opens the door. But there's another truth residing even one step before God's effectual call. Whom does He call? He calls those whom He has chosen for Himself. Notice the emphasis in verses 27 and 28 on God's choice. After admonishing the Corinthian believers to consider that God called them, he repeated three times that God chose them. God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised in the world, even things that are not, to bring to nothing things that are. God unconditionally chose you, you believers, 
for himself. It was not any loveliness in you that attracted the Lord to you so that he chose you. You were hostile in mind against the Lord, doing evil deeds. It was not because of some foreseen merit that the Lord chose you. You were dead in your trespasses and sins. You were unable and unwilling to believe, and whatever does not proceed from faith is sin. Romans 14, 23. You were a sinner and a child of wrath. There was no reason, humanly speaking, why God should choose you or choose me. He didn't choose you because of you, but He chose you despite you. And that's why I say that He unconditionally chose you. And the result is that you believed so that you are in Christ. In Christ. God unconditionally chose you for Himself and effectually called you to Himself so that you believed and were united to Jesus Christ. According to verse 2, God calls His people and they call upon the name of the Lord Jesus with saving faith. According to verse 21, God saves those who believe through the foolishness of gospel preaching. God sovereignly chose and called you, you believers, for union with Christ. And to be in Christ is to be united with Christ. This union means that uh, in the courtroom of God, I have Christ and His obedience and righteousness as my representative and not Adam and his disobedience and his unrighteousness. This uh, union with Christ means that the believer really participates in the death and resurrection of Christ even now yet not fully and finally as we will in the future. Union with Christ also means that the believer shares a vital, a living relationship with Jesus Christ. So Jesus is the true vine, and we are the branches. Christ is the head of the church, which is His body, so that Christ nourishes and cherishes the church as His own body. Christ loved the church, His bride, and gave Himself up for her. All of these images illustrate the living relationship that uh, the believer, that you share in union with Jesus Christ. And verse 30 asserts that it is because of God, not because of us, that we partake in such a blessed fellowship. It's because of God. Focusing negatively on our sin and inability This fact that it's because of God and not because of you that you are in Christ. Um, This is not the main point. So that we are supposed to read this and hate ourselves more and more. The point is that though he would have been just to do so, God has not hated you. He has loved you. He has loved you. The point is to focus on his grace. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing, it is the gift of God, not as a result of works, so that no one may boast. Boast in the Lord because He chose you, called you, and united you to Himself through faith. Boast in the Lord because of His initiating grace, but also because of His invaluable gift, Christ became to us wisdom from God, righteousness and sanctification and redemption. The righteousness and sanctification and redemption in view in verse 30 are not something other than wisdom from God. Instead, those three terms define or explain what's in view when Paul is saying that Christ became to you wisdom from God. Righteousness and sanctification and redemption explain what is in view when Paul mentions wisdom from God. So that the New International Version makes this explicit. Christ became to us wisdom from God. That is righteousness and sanctification and redemption. The significance is that, as one of the commentators, Gordon Fee, commented, is wisdom doesn't have to do with getting smart 
so to speak, in this context. The point is that true wisdom, true wisdom belongs to those who have been saved. Christ became wisdom from God for you. The problem in Corinth was that the believers were so obsessed with worldly wisdom expressed through Greek rhetoric and eloquence. This obsession caused them to pay special allegiance to different Bible teachers and leaders in the church whom they deemed as especially eloquent in speaking. Some viewed Paul, uh, Apollos more than Paul. They valued him over Paul, and they thought his presentation was better. Conversely, some valued Paul over Apollos. This divided the church, and it was a major issue. Paul's solution was to point them to the true wisdom embodied in the person of Christ, and demonstrated in his work. Look at 1 Corinthians 1, 22-24. For Jews demand signs, and Greeks seek wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and folly to the Gentiles. But to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God, and the wisdom of God. Jesus Christ himself is the wisdom and power of God. True wisdom on our part is acknowledging our own bankruptcy of righteousness and holiness and wisdom. True wisdom embraces the reality that you are or that you were a slave to sin in need of a Redeemer. Christ became to us wisdom from God, righteousness and sanctification and redemption. And these three terms are not separate realities. They're all aspects of one saving reality. They describe what Christ has done for you. And isn't that uh, so like the Lord to condescend to your level and to mine to describe things in more ways than one because it's just too wonderful for us to wrap our minds around. Uh, We need the Lord to heap up images like this so that we can wrap our minds around who Christ is for us and what He's done. First of all, Christ is your righteousness. That's a legal image, forensic. In the courtroom of God, the believer is justified, declared to be righteous. That's because Jesus Christ is righteous, and in union with Him, we are righteous. That's what Paul meant when he wrote in Philippians chapter 3, verse 9, that he made it his aim in life to be found in Christ, to be found in union with Christ. In other words, Paul wanted to be found in the courtroom of God, united to Christ, his righteous representative, rather than Adam. The result of being found in Christ is that the believer does not have a righteousness of his or her own that comes from the law. No. But that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on faith, you are justified, declared uh, to be not only innocent of crime, but positively righteous. Positively righteous in God's sight. By faith alone. How can this be? Paul's answer is found in 2 Corinthians 5.21. You could probably recite it to me. For our sake, God made Him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in Him, in union with Christ, we might become the righteousness of God. Your righteousness depends completely on Christ's obedience to the law of God, to His substitutionary atoning death on the cross for you, and to His triumphant resurrection from the dead. So that Paul wrote in Romans 4.25, Christ was delivered up for our trespasses and raised for our justification. In union with Jesus Christ the righteous, you are not only forgiven and innocent, but positively righteous in God's sight. Christ is your righteousness. Second, Christ is your sanctification. It's a religious 
metaphor or image. It means that in Christ you are still sinners. Even though you are still sinners, you are already considered to be saints. It means that in Christ you are sanctified. Paul greeted the Corinthians as those who were sanctified in Christ Jesus. Verse 2, called to be saints, together with all those who in every place call upon the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. The Corinthians and the rest of the church with them were sanctified in union with Christ. Typically, when you hear the term sanctification, you think of the ongoing process of growth and holiness that characterizes the Christian life. And that's a good thing that you think that. It's true. Progressive sanctification is a growing conformity to the image of Christ in truth, in righteousness, in holiness. That's true. However, the process of ongoing sanctification is not in view in 1 Corinthians 1.30. Instead, this displays what Professor John Murray called definitive sanctification. This entails the irreversible separation of the believer from the world. To be sanctified in Christ is to be already set apart from this world in Him. Just as Jesus lived on this earth, died, was raised, and ascended into heaven, thus separating Him from this world, so too are you in Him, in union with Him. That's what your baptism portrayed. We were buried, therefore, with Him by baptism into death, in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, so we too might walk in newness of life. You already have been definitively sanctified in Christ, in union with Jesus Christ. You are a saint in Him. This is an irreversible break with the old world of sin and death, which is made visible increasingly in your growth in real, actual, moral righteousness and holiness, your your growth in sanctification. It doesn't mean that we will be perfect in this life. We won't. But it is no less true and definitive. Christ is your sanctification. Thirdly, Christ is your redemption. It's an image from slavery. On account of sin, we labored as slaves under the curse until we were forgiven and redeemed from it. In Christ, we have redemption through His blood, Paul wrote in Ephesians 1, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of His grace, which He lavished upon us in all wisdom and insight. In union with Christ, you are redeemed out from under the smog of captivity to your sin. You're lifted into the clear skies of the new creation where you can taste freedom from tyranny. You're redeemed in Christ. He is your redemption. Boast in the Lord because He is your wisdom. Boast in the Lord because He is your righteousness and sanctification and redemption. Now, Lest we be distracted from the main point, I've, let me illustrate something to you that's very important. Uh, something that I relished when my wife and I were first married uh, was this new ability to say, what's mine is yours, and what's yours is mine. So to sweeten the deal when I wanted to buy a new book and further clutter our shelf, What's mine is yours. That's your book now. (laughs) Now, I don't know if this ever happened, but it's just hypothetical, so go with me. If I saw something as trivial as her hairbrush, I could say, what's yours is mine now. That's my brush. On this principle, we merged our bank accounts. We put both our names on the titles to the cars and all the rest. Uh, That's part and parcel of the leaving and cleaving process. It's good. I think it's right. But ultimately, I did not marry my wife so that I could say, what's yours is mine. 
I didn't marry her for her stuff, nor did she for mine. Marry me. Please, th this is the point. It's one thing to be able to say, what's mine is yours, and what's yours is mine. It's an entirely different and more precious thing to be able to say with Solomon in his song, I am my beloved, and my beloved is mine. That's the point. As wonderful as it is, the main point here is not that you are able to say, what's mine is Christ, and what's Christ is mine. Praise God, I'm righteous. Praise God, I'm sanctified and redeemed. Yeah, of course that's true. Of course. It's a priceless treasure to know that. But it's pointing to something of even more value. The point is that you believers are in union with Jesus Christ, and by virtue of that union, Christ became these saving benefits to you. You don't receive His benefits apart from receiving a living and spiritual relationship with His person. You receive not merely the gifts, but the giver Himself. You receive not merely the benefits, but the benefactor himself. Because Christ became these things for you, you can say, I am my beloved's, and my beloved is mine. I'm Christ's, and Christ is mine. Is that your perspective this morning, church? What more could you ask for? This is what Paul had in mind in Philippians 3 when he spoke of the incomparable worth of knowing Jesus Christ. There's nothing that compares to this. Boast in the Lord because He is yours and you are His. Boast in Him because He is your wisdom, your righteousness and sanctification and redemption. Boast in the Lord not only because of His initiating grace, but also because of His invaluable gift. Now having unfolded not only the demand that you should boast in the Lord, and having considered also the motivating reasons why you should boast in the Lord, uh, we look now at how you should boast in the Lord. This is a representative list and not an exhaustive one. And like I said at the beginning, I, I don't see into your hearts this morning. Uh, the Lord needs to deal with you on an individual basis. But these are uh, clear biblical examples. First of all, boast in the Lord by refusing to boast in men. There are many gifted men out in the broader church some of whom have stood in this pulpit, in fact. And you can access their preaching or podcasts at any point in time. Um, and our church has been blessed to have faithful leaders throughout its history. And we give thanks for that. It's a very good thing. It's a blessing. We can and we should honor and give thanks to the Lord for the teachers and leaders that He provides. Uh, but one of the key burdens of our text is that we would not go so far as to boast in men. It leads to divisions where there should be unity. So rather than boasting in men, you should regard your preachers and leaders as what they really are. Servants. Planters. Waterers. What then is Paul? What is Apollos? He wrote, Servants, through whom you believed, as the Lord assigned to each. I planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the growth. God is the one who gives life and growth, so boast in Him, not men. Secondly, boast in the Lord by putting no confidence in the flesh. 
Don't boast in your academic attainment or natural wisdom. Don't take pride in your economic prosperity. What do you have that you have not received from the Lord? Don't boast in your social status, past achievements, experiences. Boast in the Lord by boasting in your weakness revealed through suffering. I I think this is especially relevant for our congregation. For Paul, suffering was the prime context for boasting in the Lord because it revealed just how weak he was in and of himself. He wrote in 2 Corinthians 11.30, If I must boast, I will boast of things that show my weakness. Paul's weakness displayed Christ's power. The Lord said to him, My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is perfected in weakness. And Paul's response is an example for us to imitate. This is 2 Corinthians 12, verse 9. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly of my weaknesses, so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Many of you are enduring suffering, physical or otherwise. You're encountering challenges that I know nothing about, that I've never experienced. There are severe physical ailments and surgeries among those of our congregation. There are strained relationships, whether in the family or the workplace. There are fears. There are depressing circumstances. As your weakness is revealed through these trials, Boast in the Lord all the more. Be confident that your suffering has a purpose. This is where Christ's power, it's where Christ's power is perfected and portrayed. The grace of God is sufficient for you and His power is perfected in weakness. Boast in the Lord because God chose and called you for union with Jesus Christ who is your wisdom righteousness, sanctification, and redemption. Ultimately, boast in the Lord by boasting in nothing but the cross. Galatians chapter 6, verse 14, Far be it from me to boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by which the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. Can you say that? Can you say that with the Apostle Paul? Can you say that your pride, confidence, and trust before God is in the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ? Can you say that? Take inventory of your heart, asking the Holy Spirit to uncover any sin. What are you boasting in, if not the Lord? Where else is your confidence, if not in the Lord? And if you cannot say that your boast before God is in the cross of Christ, then I would plead with you. Plead with you. To embrace Him. You are unrighteous in God's sight, defiled and a slave to sin. You may have the righteousness, sanctification, and redemption that you need to stand before God, but you may not have it without having Christ Himself. So agree with God that you are a sinner in need of His grace and embrace Christ this morning. All of us can say with Jeremiah, Heal me, O Lord, and I shall be healed. Save me, and I shall be saved. For you are my boast. Now let's do that together as we stand and sing hymn number seven. I'm sorry, hymn number eight, in Christ alone. Oh, Father, we thank you for sending your Son and your Spirit for us and for our salvation. Thank you for your Word, for the encouragement and instruction that's found there, and for giving us one another, for giving us this church, a place to belong and a place to call upon your name together 
as we go from here, Lord, as you send us out, I pray that we would be uh, fruitful and effective in encouraging one another and strengthening one another, edifying uh, the body by the power of your spirit. Uh, help your people, Lord, and encourage them this week, I pray. Now may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen.